Good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. How is everybody? All right. I like the statement of mediocrity today. Love it. Hey, uh, I am so glad that you're here. My name is JC. Ryan has asked me to speak today. Uh, if you're wondering what JC stands for, I'm still trying to figure it out, okay? But my mom has been calling me that since I was born, and I like it. Uh, today, we are going to be continuing a series called Worth Repeating. We're in week four. We've been talking about um, some stories that Jesus told and some things that we need to remember, stories that are worth repeating. And so if you've got your Bible that we have here, uh, you're going to be on page 839. If you've got a Bible that is not the one that we provide for you, you we'll be in Luke 14, 8 through 11. Luke 14, 8 through 11. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I hate coming in anything but first. First is it for me. Anybody else like that? It doesn't matter what it is. It could be a race. It could be a basketball game. It could be a video game, a board game. It could be who gets in the house after your car arrives at home. It could be the first person out of the bed and also the first person into the bed. It could be the first person to finish their dinner. It could be the first person to take their shoes off when you get home. Literally anything is available for first place. And that has always been me since I was a youngling. I have always wanted to be in first. Is anybody like me in that? Are any of you like me? Just a few of you. The rest of you are probably normal. That's wonderful. Good for you. <laughs> Some of us are, are just wounded people that we're trying to figure out why we're compensating and trying to win first and everything else, okay? Uh, but today we're talking about a specific quality, something that Jesus says is better than winning, better than being successful, and better than being in first place, and that is humility. Now, before we talk about the story from Scripture today that Jesus told that Luke recorded, uh, we need to talk about what the word humility actually means, because humility is kind of like a weird thing. I don't, I don't know if you've ever heard like being humble. Anybody ever heard the word humility before? Raise your hand so I can see. Okay, a few of you. Okay, so humility is kind of weird, because the better you get at it, maybe the worse that you're getting at it, because if you get better at humility, you feel like man, I'm getting really good at this. And then you're like, wait a minute, am, now, am I turning proud now? Like, what? I'm, I'm proud of my humility. What, what is happening? And so you've got this weird, like, tension of I'm trying to be more humble, and yet if I'm growing in humility and I have an awareness of it, am I really getting more humble or am I getting less humble? What is happening? So let's simplify what humility is today so that you can truly tell if it's something that you can improve upon. And it's just this. Humility is putting others first. Everybody say that. Humility is putting others first. Now for me, I remember being a child, I would never have done that because that would mean I was in second and second is last. So I would never be in second place. So for me, this is not natural for me. Okay? And I literally mean this for everything. Okay? If you were with me, and let's say we just went to a sporting event, okay, and we leave, I'm going to try and beat you to the car. I'm not telling you that's what we're doing. I'm not declaring it. But in my mind, if I touch that door before you touch your door, I'm the winner. I'm the winner. Now, that's weird and crazy, but this is something that I've got to pay attention to because it's something that Jesus says is important. Now, before we talk about the story, i got one more thing I want to share with you because I think this will kind of help shape for you what this means when it comes to our relationship with God. I've got a picture I want to show you. Does anyone in this room own a dog? Anyone in this room own a dog? Okay, good, good. All right, put your hands down. I was having this discussion earlier where I was clearly telling someone that dogs are better than cats in every way, shape, and form. No need to debate it. It's just a proven fact. Uh, there's literally scientific evidence behind it. You can Google it. Um, but here's the deal. This has anyone, anyone who owns a dog, if you own a cat and don't own a dog, you can't answer this question. You just have to listen and observe everyone else, okay? But if you own a dog, have you ever been eating something in front of your dog and they're just looking at you? So, now, here's what we're going to do. In order to illustrate, to see if this is really you, put your hands down, put your hands down. 
If this is your dog and you've ever seen your dog interact with you when you're eating something in front of it, on the count of three, I want you to look at your neighbor and make the face that your dog makes at you when you're eating something in front of them on the count of three, okay? You can practice if you want. I see some of you already practicing your face right now. It's kind of weird, okay? But you're not a dog. It's okay. On the count of three, find a neighbor, show them your face. One, two, three. <laughs> Some of you look sad. Some of you look a little frustrated. Some of you are just staring endlessly into the void. Now, here's the deal. Here's the deal. Quiet down. Dogs internally, dogs internally, have, they live by something called pack mentality, which means they will never take a piece of food that someone who ranks above them has. So if the pack leader, which generally is all of the human beings in your home, if your dog has been properly trained and conditioned to be a dog, then your dog will never take a piece of food from you. If you leave it on the table and you're not there, 100% the dog will take it because it does not belong to you. It belongs to no one. And so your dog will take it. But if you are holding it, your dog will do much like what this dog is doing and stare at you. Until, you, until it convinces you to do something. Now, I know that sounds crazy, but this is what it's like in relationship with God. Because we cannot, we cannot take anything from God's hands. We can't. So when I think about prayer, my, my favorite author, when he talks about the spiritual life, he talks about prayer in this way, like a dog looking at its owner with a sandwich. And we stare, maybe we beg, maybe we make a sad face, maybe we do whatever we can, because I know Kevin talked about this last week, begging's okay, like doing this thing with God of just asking and asking and asking is okay, but we can't ever take anything from God. The only thing that we can do is receive what God gives to us. We can only receive. And so humility is understanding. Humility is understanding that God is in control of everything. And I am completely dependent on him in order to receive. So let's let's have this story. Now, before this, I need I need to set up the story. I need to set the scene. Um, I need Haytham. Will you come up here for me? You seem like a strong man. Are you strong, Haytham? Okay, cool. (laughs) Kids. Be confident, okay? We, we just saw a classic example of not confident. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to help me carry this table. Do you think you can do that? You just grab that end, okay? Everybody give it up for Haytham. <laughs> wow. You know, I was worried, but now I'm not. Thank you very much. That's all I needed. Thank you. <laughs> now, let's pretend for a moment that you're at a party in the ancient Middle East, okay? And Jesus is invited to this party. And then Jesus, like he classically does, does something extraordinary. He tells a parable about a party while he's at a party that he was invited to. Now, I think that's funny because a lot of times when Jesus tells a story, he'll be like in a city or a village somewhere, and he'll tell a story about like sheep, right? But there's no sheep around at the time. He's not like pointing, like, look at those sheep over there. Like, pretend you're a shepherd. No, no, no. Like, he got invited to a party, and then he sits down, and he's like, guys, let me tell you a story about a party. That's exactly what Jesus does. And you know why he does that? Because the people at the party are feeling what Jesus is talking about. So here's what he talks about in verse 8 of chapter 14. And I'm going to read it from my Bible translation, but the verses are on the screen. We're going to read 8 and 9, take a break, okay? When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. Now, here's the deal. Let's, let's illustrate this in modern times, okay? So, in ancient times, you would actually have in a space, a banquet space, a, a meeting space, in our vernacular, the living room, which is weird, and I don't want to get into it, but you, don't, you do other living activities in other rooms, but apparently this one's the living room. So, anyway, so you have a couch here, and then you'd make a U-shape, and the couches on the side would face each other. But at the head, or the U, the crest of that particular gathering, that couch is the person who's hosting the party. 
and everyone closer to that person sitting at the couch, they're the people in highest connection, most important, most favored, most honored guests. The further you get away down the U, the least favored, the least honored, but they still got invited to the party, okay? So let's pretend for a second that someone that you all know throws a party, and he invites everyone in this room. Ryan hosts a party. Some people are really, Ryan, maybe you need to think about this as like a ministry event, like Ryan's party. Come to Ryan's party. Uh, <laughs> now, we all know that I would be the most distinguished guest at Ryan's party because I'm his boss, and so I would be next to him. But, but there's a person that lives with Ryan, and he might think that he's the most distinguished guest, and he's known Ryan longer than I have. So maybe he's thinking to himself, I mean, I got to be next to Ryan. So Chris Burt shows up to the party. And he moseys on over here to Ryan. He's like, hey, Ryan, what's up? What's up? Now, I'm clearly not at the party yet, okay? And this is going to turn out very embarrassing for Chris Birch. Because when I show up in this culture, Ryan would have to look at Chris Birch and say, Chris, hey, JC's here. You're going to have to get up and move. And Chris would go, oh. And then he would mosey on down to a place of lesser honor. Now, some of you in this room, you're going, what a weird place to grow up in that you would shamefully make someone stand up. Now, I want to give you an example of that. This is just culture. There's no, it's, it's, new, it's neutral. It's not right or wrong, okay? But in our world, anybody at your house, when someone comes into your home or when you come into your own home, you have to take your shoes off? Now, in my house, we never had to do that when I grew up. But then I got married, and my wife was like, we, we take our shoes off at this house. I was like, oh, Okay. She told me all these facts about germs and stuff like that, which I think is a bunch of hogwash, but whatever. Uh, so, but anyway, I was like, yes, ma'am. If you want me to take my shoes off, I'll take my shoes off. So when you come to my house, you take your shoes off. If I come to your house and you don't want me to take my shoes off, guess what? I won't take my shoes off, okay? You're entering into the culture of that house. And in this world, the most, the closest people, those deserving of honor would sit closest to those who host the party, which in this case is Ryan. So if you want to be invited to Ryan's party and sit close to him, you better suck up to him and bribe him and be nice to him and love him, okay? And of course, I do all those things very well. So that is why I would be the closest. Now, you don't want to feel this shame. You don't want to feel embarrassed. You don't want to feel guilty for taking a spot that's not rightfully yours. So Jesus gives you an option. He says this in verse 10. He says, but when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. And then Jesus gives this statement, which is really meant to drive home the idea that Jesus is teaching about. And he says this, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So if Chris's attitude is like, hey, I know that Ryan's invited me to the party that's at his house, and I live at this house, but I'm just going to be right here at the party, maybe even not close enough to be honored. But then Ryan comes in and he goes, hey, Chris, Chris, why are you sitting over there? You should be closer. So Chris is like, ooh, yay. And then he moseys on a little closer, right? And then he feels honored. He feels welcome. Now, here's the crazy part, and I just want to put this in your brain to think about. If everyone sat in their rightful place in relationship to the person hosting the party, no one, no one would be frustrated. You know why? Because they would all understand properly the relationship that these people have with the host. It's when we don't understand or we've got a different idea and it's the host's responsibility to let everybody know this is the way things should be arranged. Now, it feels shameful because we go, well, maybe I feel like I should be in a different seat. But to the host, the host determines that. So for me, humility is important for us to understand because humility puts us in the position of receiving rather than trying to manufacture or manipulate, to leverage those types of things. So on your, your handout, putting others first changes us. Putting others first changes us. To go back to the illustration of the dog, 
Imagine your dog is staring at you as you're eating a, a burger. And just, you know those dog stares? You know what I'm talking about? Like, they're never going to leave your eyes. They're never going to blink. They're just going to stare into your soul. <laughs> and then let's just say you love your dog so much, and maybe your mom and dad aren't looking. So you tear off a piece of your burger, and you throw it to your dog. What is your dog's reaction? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Literally all of the front row at the same time goes, <laughs> It's exactly what your dog is going to do. Do you think your dog is going to do normal activities? No. They may spin around. They're going to wag their tail. They're going to lick their lips. They're going to literally, like a vacuum cleaner, suck down this piece of burger. They won't even chew it. And then they will just, they will love it for about two seconds. And then what will they do? (laughs) They will go, (laughs) That's exactly what they will do. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing. That's us. That's us. When we choose to place ourselves with an attitude of humility, we, we receive, when we receive from God, when we receive from our dad, when we receive honor, it feels fantastic. We love it. 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 And we're like, yeah! And then two seconds later, we're like, what else do you got for me? But here's here's the practice I want you to understand. The more that you can place yourself in the posture of dependence, reception, and choosing to honor someone else, you will change. Yes, it will be good for everybody else. Yes, other people will benefit. But you will change. It's one of the problems sometimes that I see with people when they go on mission trips. You know, we hear all the time when people go on mission trips, they're like, well, it's really about the people you're going on a mission trip with, but you feel like you get more out of it. That's true, but that's not a shame. Don't be shamed by that. You should change when you go to some, some other place. You should change your perspective and your point of view when you see someone who lives life differently than you. When you choose to put them and who they are in front of your own needs and wants, it should change you. That's not negative. That's wonderful. And it's wonderful for someone else to share who they are and share their perspective and share their culture. Things can be mutually beneficial. And we don't have to measure out, is this one good? Is this one good? Is this one bad? Is this one bad? We get in this shame culture sometimes of like, if I change for the better, I should feel bad for that. No, you shouldn't. You shouldn't feel bad for a different perspective. Proverbs 11.2 teaches this principle. It's on, your, it's on your handout. It just says, pride leads to disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. So what Jesus is saying here is humility is not only better than success and winning and being praised and honored. Humility already has its own benefit, but in addition to its own benefit, you also get wisdom. It's tough to learn when you take control of a situation. It's tough to learn when you take control of a situation. And Jesus talks about that. So for me, here's some practical ways that I think you can learn to practice humility in your life. Now, apart from God, apart from our attitude of dependence, apart from our dog stare at God, saying, God, I need you. You must be my resource. Please help me. Apart from that, none of these practices will make you more humble. God has to transform you. God has to resource you. So we've got to start with the attitude of, God, I need you. I need you. But then here's some things we can do, things you can do to improve your characteristic of humility. Number one, this one's going to be tough, very difficult. Be yourself. Be yourself. Now, this is a question, this tripped up the first service, but I believe in you. I believe you can answer this question correctly. It is not a trick question. Who determines who you are? Wrong. God. God determines who I am. God determines who you are. Let me give you a quick example. God chose your parents. He also chose the parents who you grew up with. Even if they adopted you, God chose them. Even if you don't have 
what you think is the right, quote unquote, set of parents. God chose that for you because it's what you need most. God chose to give you the type of personality that you have. God chose you to have the the qualities, the characteristics of you. God chose those things. He chose whether you would be a boy, a girl. He chose what state you'll live in. He chose what things that will bring you pleasure. He chose all of those things. Let me give you a small example of this. I've got two boys, a seven-year-old and a three-year-old. They are dramatically different. My seven-year-old could run literally an entire day. He could run for 24 hours straight and not get tired and want to run more. Small example, Saturday we play basketball. He literally runs the entire time. And when I say run, I don't mean like he's like, "Ah," like sprinting up and down the court as fast as possible the entire game. And then the game is over. And he sprints out to the lobby at South Campus so he can play foosball fast. And then when we're done, you know what he does? He sprints to the car as fast as humanly possible. He jumps out of the car when we get home, and he's playing basketball immediately. That's my seven-year-old. My three-year-old, he would never do that, literally ever. He would run a little bit, and then he'd be like, I'm not running anymore. (laughs) Running's dumb, right? Now, my three-year-old is hilarious. He is the funniest human being I've ever met on planet Earth. If you were to spend 10 minutes with him, he would make you smile. The life verse that we chose for him, part of it says that he, the Lord has refreshed our hearts. I think that's him. I think that's my youngest son. You can't be around him and be sad. You just can't. It's, it's physically impossible. He will bring a smile to your face somehow. And if he doesn't know how, he'll do so. He, like, he literally, I went to his class this week. He was hitting himself in the face. Not hard, but so people would laugh at him. And I'm going, don't do that. But also, hilarious. That's him. And listen, listen, guys, I didn't choose that. I'm his dad. I didn't choose for him to be that way. I didn't, like, set up some life plan of, like, all right, our oldest child, he's going to run all the time. We're just going to, everything we do is a race, okay? We're just going to do this all the time. Youngest son, we're just going to play comedy. No, no, no serious, no drama, only humor. Like, we're, that's all we're doing. Only jokes. Everything he says, we're going to laugh at. No, we didn't do that. God chose those personality aspects for them. So be yourself. But first, in order to be yourself, you've got to figure out from God, who am I? Who am I? Second, don't pretend. Don't pretend. It seems a little bit like the first, but once you figure out who you are, don't pretend to be anyone or anything else. Because you're good enough. You don't need to pretend to be anybody else. I love being JC. But there are things in other people I look at and I go... I kind of like that. I wish I could sing. I wish I could play an instrument. I wish I was as funny as Bryson. I wish I could run without getting tired like Cannon. I wish I could climb trees like Ryan. I wish I could grow a beard like Hatham. Well, I can probably grow a beard better than you, Hatham. But (laughs) still pretty good. But I don't have to pretend to be anybody else other than me. You don't have to pretend to be anybody else other than you. God loves you, and he loves you just the way that he made you to be. He made you on purpose. He made you with the personality that you have. And you don't have to pretend to be anything special. You can just be you. Why did what? No, you're not annoying, bro. You're fantastic, wonderful, amazing. And you don't have to pretend to be annoying to feel like you're cool. You can just be you. Third thing. Third thing, and this will help you understand this third thing. Don't push. Don't push. Now, it seems easy, but this maybe is the most difficult thing. I'll give you some examples of this. When you go to the lunch line at your school, don't skip. Just get in the place in line. I know that seems simple, but why are you in such a hurry? I'll give you another example. This has probably never happened to any of you in this room. You ever ask your mom something, and she's like, no, 100 times no, never, ever, ever. And then then you're like, I'm just going to ask Dad. Be honest. Be honest. Raise your hand if you've ever done that at least one time. And maybe for you, it's not your mom. Maybe it's your dad. All right, just a quick survey. Quick survey. Maybe I'll share this with parents. Quick survey. Who's like, Dad is never going to say yes? Raise your hand. Dad's the no person. Dad's the yes person. Wow. I'm shocked by that. Okay, put your hands down. Who's like, mom is the no person? Wow! (laughs) Amazing. All right, all right, all right. 
That is an example. Listen, that's an example of pushing. You don't get your way, so you go figure out a way to get your way. Rather than try to understand, why did they tell me no? We just have this view of you're going to get what you want. Do you do that with God? Something happens, maybe God says no to you, or maybe you read, you read the Bible and you go, God doesn't seem to approve of this particular thing or behavior, but you just decide, nah, I'm going to do it anyway. Yes. Or nah, I'm going to go Google something that lines up with what I believe. Or no, I'm going to go ask somebody that I know doesn't believe this, so then I'll feel better about doing what he asked me to do. Don't push. Receive from God and do what he asks you to do. Okay? So here's the thing. Here's the question I've got for you. What's one thing this week that you can do to practice humility? What's one thing that you can do this week to practice humility? Maybe it's figuring out who you really are. Maybe it's choosing actively never to pretend, but honestly telling each story to your parents when they ask you what's going on, to only tell the truth. Maybe it's not to manipulate, to push, to leverage. Those are things that you can practice. And what happens is, is with God's help, as God resources you, as God's put you in situations for you to practice humility, what you'll start to understand is humility changes you. And then, not only will humility just change you, then you'll start to acquire this thing called wisdom. And you'll start living life a little differently. So that's my challenge this week. As you get in small groups, I want you to share what is one way that you can practice humility. And even, what's something that you've seen somebody do that's a very humble thing? I had somebody sharing a story out there. I don't know if you guys know who this is, but Deion Sanders. Y'all ever heard of Deion Sanders? Yeah. Prime time, high step to the end zone, maybe the greatest defensive back of all time, at least by name. What? He played against the Cleveland Browns. This guy was telling me he was at the game. And Deion, before the game starts, there's a few people there. He comes up to the end of the stands, and he goes, Hey, guys, tell me what you think. What can I do to entertain you? I'm so glad you guys spent money to do this. These are opposing fans. And then he said, I'm going to beat you. But I'd still like you to have fun while you're here. I don't want you to be mad at me because I'm going to beat your team. I've, I've never heard of that. Like, I've never heard of an athlete saying, I'm, I know you're here to see me. I want to make this entertaining for you. I want to make this valuable for you. And humility doesn't mean that you have to devalue yourself. It doesn't mean you have to think less of yourself. It just means thinking more of someone else. So, let's pray and I pray that you'll, you'll start taking some steps to put others first in your life. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you, God, that you were the primary example of humility for us. That you are deserving of everyone, everyone's honor and praise. And yet you humbled yourself. So I pray, God, today you'd, you'd help us understand what it looks like to be humble in this culture. And I pray that you'd give us practical ways that we can embrace, embrace you, embrace your way of life, and be humble so that you can change us. And I pray that as we align ourselves to the way that you have taught us to live, I pray, God, that you'll, you'll allow us to see changes in fruit. And maybe we'll get to celebrate some of those small things like our dogs would when we give them a piece of food. But God, I pray that we keep our focus and our attention on you and that we'd be ready to receive whatever you have for us. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. Amen.